ஹலோ எவ்ரி ஒன் வெல்கம் டு ஏ டு இசட் டென்டிஸ்ட்ரி டென்டல் லெக்சர்ஸ் மேட் ஈஸி இன் திஸ் வீடியோ வீல் டிஸ்கஸ் இன் டீட்டெயில் அபவுட் த எட்டியாலஜி அண்ட் கிளாஸிஃபிகேஷன் ஆஃப் வேரியஸ் டிசீசஸ் ஆஃப் த பல்ப் அண்ட் ரிவர்சிபிள் பல்பைட்டிஸ் இன் டீட்டெயில் திஸ் டாபிக் இஸ் ஆஃப் அட்மோஸ்ட் இம்பார்ட்டன்ஸ் இஸ் ஃபார் அஸ் டென்டல் ஸ்டூடெண்ட்ஸ் ஆர் கன்சர்ன் பிகாஸ் அஸ் வி நோ த மோஸ்ட் காமன் காஸ் பை பேஷண்ட் சீக் டென்டல் ட்ரீட்மெண்ட் இஸ் பே and this pain can be caused due to various odontogenic and non odontogenic causes like palpal diseases periapical diseases periodontal diseases tmj disorders neuralgias and pain arising from various orofacial structures out of all these palpal and periapical diseases contribute to more than 80 percentage of the cases so we must have a thorough knowledge of the subject so that the diagnosis of these lesions can be made easy because an accurate palpal diagnosis is the key to all endodontic procedures now before going to the classification of palpal diseases we'll have a quick recap of the anatomy of the tooth as we know the tooth has a crown and a root the crown has an outermost covering of enamel and an inner layer of dentine and the root has an outer covering of cementum and an inner layer of dentine and pulp is the soft tissue component of the tooth it lies in the innermost portion and is composed of connective tissue cells blood vessels and nerves these blood vessels and nerves enter the pulp through the apical foramen and pulp is that portion of the tooth which gives the tooth its vitality so if pulp is dead that means the tooth is dead or non vital so every effort should be made to preserve the vitality of the pulp as it is an integral part of the tooth both anatomically and functionally the diseases of the pulp can be broadly classified into three that is pulpitis pulp degeneration and pulp necrosis we'll discuss about pulpitis in detail in this video what is pulpitis itis means inflammation an inflammation is defined as the body's response to injury due to any agent so pulpitis means it is an inflammation of the dental pulp tissue or it is the response of the pulp to an injury there are various classification systems for a pulpitis based on reversibility it can be classified into reversible and irreversible pulpitis based on rate of extension it can be classified into acute and chronic pulpitis chronic pulpitis is of three types asymptomatic with pulpal exposure chronic hyperplastic pulpitis and internal resorption based on extension of involvement it can be classified into focal or a subtotal or a partial pulpitis where only a portion of the pulp is involved and total or a generalized pulpitis where the entire pulp is involved but this classification does not have so much of a clinical significance now based on the presence or absence of symptoms it can be classified into symptomatic and asymptomatic pulpitis based on communication between pulp and oral environment it can be classified into pulpitis aperta or open pulpitis where there is a communication between pulp and oral environment and pulpitis closa or closed pulpitis where there is no communication between pulp and the oral environment now we move on to the causes of pulp and periapical diseases so the causes can be physical chemical or a biologic or a bacterial causes so physical causes can be of three types that is mechanical thermal or a electric cause so the mechanical causes of pulp injury could be a trauma such as an accidental fall it may result in a fracture of the tooth and may cause a disease of the pulp or sometimes the trauma can be iatrogenic for example when you are trying to remove a deep caries the bar may accidentally expose the pulp so there may be a pinpoint pulpal exposure which causes a pulpal injury another reason could be pathological wear such as a deep abrasion or an abrasion resulting in an exposure of the pulp so this also may cause a inflammation of the pulp next is cracked tooth syndrome which is a deep crack through the body of the tooth through which the bacteria from the saliva may enter the pulp and the reason is excessive forces that is used in a orthodontic tooth movement and a barodontalgia 
the crack tooth syndrome and barodontalgia will be discussed in detail in another session moving on to various thermal causes first one heat that is produced during cavity preparation the high speed tungsten carbide burst or diamond burst they usually reduce the operating time but they accelerate the pulpal death if it is used without a coolant so heat generated during their use may be sufficient to cause an irreversible pulp damage so adequate water cooling is necessary when these bursts are used at high speeds now another reason could be conduction of heat and cold through deep fillings especially metallic fillings that is given without an intermediate cement so they usually come conduct the temperature changes rapidly into the pulp and they may also cause a irreversible pulpal damages especially foodstuffs like eating ice creams drinking hot coffee or chewing ice cubes this may contribute to the pulpal injury another causes could be frictional heat that is produced during polishing of a filling or during setting of a cement so these injuries are usually reversible in nature another reason is galvanic current that is produced from a dissimilar metals for example if an amalgam restoration is present opposite to a gold restoration what happens is there will be production of a galvanic current in presence of saliva which act as an electrolyte so this galvanic current will be transmitted from the metallic restoration into the pulp resulting in a pulpal injury now the chemical causes of pulpal injury could be phosphoric acid acrylic monomer etc which can reach the pulp through the dentinal tubules or it could be due to erosions from acids for example citric acid soft drinks or gert that is gastro esophageal reflux disease it is a condition whereby the acidic components of the stomach are regurgitated into the oral cavity causing erosions and next is the bacterial causes and this is the most common cause for the pulpal pathology so it could be due to toxins associated with the caries or a direct invasion of the microorganisms to the pulp from the caries or a trauma or it could be due to a periodontal abscess for example if the patient has a periodontal infection the microbes may enter from the periodontal pocket into the pulp through the accessory canals or the lateral canals and cause a pulpal injury another reason is blood borne microorganisms resulting in anachoretic pulpitis and this will be discussed in another video so now we will discuss about the most common cause that is a invasion of the pulp from the caries so the caries usually starts from the enamel and then progress further to involve the dentine so at this stage the patient usually experience a foot lodgement and if it is not treated at this particular stage uh it will lead to the involvement of the pulp so the presence or absence of this bacterial irritation is the determining factor in the pulp survival because once the pulp has been invaded with the bacteria the damage is almost always irreparable and the bacteria usually recovered from the infected vital pulps are streptococci staphylococci and some anaerobic microorganisms like porphyromonas gingivalis p endodontalis fusobacterium nucleatum tryponema denticola etc so later on what happen is this pulpal injury will involve the entire pulp resulting in a death of the pulp so as i mentioned the two dk involving enamel and dentine when there is a deep dentinal caries this will result in a mild to moderate inflammatory changes within the pulp and this in inflammatory changes is characterized by a dilatation of the pulp vessels and there is an increase in the vascular permeability of the pulp vessels so increase in the vascular permeability will result in exudation from the blood vessels into the connective tissue and this will result in a edema formation within the pulp and this is the stage of reversible pulpitis now what happens is there will be prolonged bacterial infection if it is not treated at that particular stage and this will result in a pulpal necrosis because considerable inflammatory exudate will accumulate within the pulp and the patient will experience pain because of the pressure of on the nerve endings because of these inflammatory exudates and necrosis occurs because 
there will be disturbance in the nutritional supply so the leukocytes will die and there will be formation of the pus that is micro abscesses will be formed within the pulp and this is the stage of acute irreversible pulpitis now two things may happen if the pulp has a very low resistance this will further lead into a stage of chronic irreversible pulpitis whereas if the pulp is highly resistant for example in case of a very young individuals the pulp will be very active so in such cases it will lead into a stage of chronic hyperplastic pulpitis so this chronic process may contribute um, continue until most or all of the pulp is involved ultimately leading to its death and in the course of this development the organisms may be killed but more commonly these organisms will survive and they set up a reaction in the periapical tissues so these microorganisms enter the periapical tissues through the apical foramen and they will cause a periapical pathology there now we'll move on to the first entity that is reversible pulpitis as the name indicates here the inflammation of the pulp is reversible by reversible what you mean is this pulp is capable of returning back to a normal state if that noxious stimuli is removed so it is very simple by definition it is a mild to moderate inflammatory condition of the pulp which is caused by a noxious stimuli in which the pulp is capable of returning to the uninflamed state following removal of the stimuli so here there will be a 2 tk it will be very deep causing a dilatation of the pulp vessels and edema formation the most common presenting symptom for a patient with a acute reversible pulpitis will be pain so one thing you have to remember is that these lesions of the pulp can easily be diagnosed from the patient's history so whenever you take a history you should take a detailed history of pain from the patient so that the diagnosis of these lesions will be very easy for you so when you take a pain history please make sure that the following points are noted down clearly that is site and duration of the pain the onset nature and progression of the pain the severity or the intensity of pain what are the aggravating and relieving factors of pain and whether the pain is radiating or a non radiating type of so usually the acute reversible pulpitis is characterized by a sharp pain that lasts for a few seconds which subsides on removal of the stimuli and the aggravating factors here is most often cold or a sweet food and they do not usually produce any spontaneous or unprovoked pain and the pain is usually intermittent and mild to moderate in intensity and it is usually non radiating so the diagnosis can easily be made from the patient symptoms and when you go for a clinical examination upon inspection you may be able to see a deep carious lesion and there will not be any vestibular obliteration and when you palpate the tooth there will not be any tooth mobility and there will be no vestibular tenderness and upon vertical percussion the tooth will be non tender you can go for some chair side investigations like thermal test so in thermal test the tooth will react more readily to a cold than a normal tooth and the pain will disappear on removal of the stimulus and in electric pulp test it will be positive when you take a radiograph what you can see is a radiolucency in the coronal portion involving the enamel and dentin it may be approaching the pulp or sometimes you see a restoration below which there is a radiolucency that is approximating the pulp which is a secondary caries approximating pulp and in all pulpal pathologies remember one thing that the periapical area will appear completely normal there will not be any periapical changes now what is the treatment for reversible pulpitis the main treatment is the removal of the noxious stimuli so in case of a caries you have to remember the entire caries and then you can go for a restoration permanent restoration but sometimes what happens is you won't be able to give a accurate diagnosis sometimes you will be in doubt whether it is a reversible pulpitis or an irreversible pulpitis because the patient's symptoms may not give a proper clue into the accurate diagnosis so in such cases what you can do is you can remove the caries 
and if it is very deep give a calcium hydroxide liner and then go for a temporary restoration using zinc oxide eugenol then we ask the patient to wait for a period of 4 to 6 weeks during this period if the patient does not complain of any symptoms you can go for a permanent restoration but if the patient complains of any pain or a swelling during this period it means that the disease has progressed further into the stage of irreversible pulpitis or some periapical pathologies so you have to go for a root canal treatment the prognosis of reversible pulpitis is usually good if the irritant is removed at a very early stages the differential diagnosis can be irreversible pulpitis for further reference you can refer the grossman's textbook of endodontic practice and schaefer's textbook of oral pathology in next session we will discuss about irreversible pulpitis and chronic hyperplastic pulpitis so keep watching thank you